chemists rely on nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, spectroscopy to deduce the structures of all sorts of molecules. Luckily for organic chemists, both carbon and hydrogen have isotopes that are NMR active, C13 and H1, and these two elements are present in virtually all organic molecules. We'll start our discussion of using NMR spectroscopy with carbon-13. Carbon forms the backbone of literally all organic molecules. That's, what's, that's what makes them organic. While carbon-12 is the most abundant isotope, it has an even numbers of protons and neutrons, and doesn't have the property of spin that's necessary for NMR activity. Carbon-13, on the other hand, has an odd number of neutrons, and it turns out does have spin. Even though C13 only accounts for about 1.1% of carbon in the natural world, that's enough for it to be useful. Because carbon-13 nuclei are NMR active, when they're placed in a strong magnetic field, they absorb photons in the radio frequency range and the precise frequencies of those photons give us information about the electronic environment that carbon atom is in. So let's get straight to the point. What do the data look like, and what do they tell us about chemical structure? The carbon-13 NMR spectrum has an x-axis that shows frequency of absorbed radiation, albeit in a strange way. This axis actually shows delta, called the chemical shift which is a normalized frequency. Since the frequencies of photons abs absorbed by a given molecule depend on the strength of the magnetic field they're in, this scale allows researchers with different instruments and different magnets to use the same scale. The units are parts per million, or ppm, for reasons that aren't terribly important to us, but you can read about it on page 56 of the textbook. Suffice it to say, for carbon NMR, the scale runs from low frequency at the right to high frequency at the left. Yes, it's backwards, just like IR spectroscopy. Don't worry about why. The scale is calibrated to a reference molecule, tetramethylsilane, or TMS, whose absorption frequency is arbitrarily set to zero. Typical spectra go up to about 220 parts per million. We describe these sorts of spectra by saying low frequency absorption is upfield or shielded, while high frequency absorption is downfield or deshielded. For every unique carbon atom in a structure, we see a sharp peak, almost a line, indicating that frequency that the carbon absorbs. Carbon atoms are identical or equivalent if they are in indistinguishable environments within the molecule. That is, if they're related by symmetry or by rapid rotation. In the compound diisopropyl ether, the two halves of the molecule are related by symmetry, while the methyl groups at each end can, in can interchange with each other by rapid rotation around this single bond. Therefore, this compound shows two distinct peaks in the NMR spectrum. The spectrum can generally be divided into two main regions. From about 0 to 100 ppm are sp3 hybridized carbon atoms, and above 100 ppm are sp2 hybridized carbons. Within each region, proximity to electronegative atoms tends to cause a peak to be more downfield. So alkane carbons are typically below 50 ppm, while sp3 carbons bonded to halides, nitrogen, or oxygen are further downfield. Within the sp2 region, alkene carbons are typically between 100 and 150 ppm, the carbons in benzene rings between 120 and 160 ppm, and carbonyl carbons much more downfield typically well above 160 ppm. 
For instance, this is the C13 NMR spectrum of T-butyl vinyl ketone. The three methyl groups are all equivalent by rapid rotation and are quite far from any electronegative atoms. They appear here at about 28 ppm. This quaternary carbon is also sp3 hybridized and is slightly closer to oxygen, so appears slightly further downfield. Note that it's not directly bonded to oxygen, so the downfield shift is relatively minor. The other carbon atoms are all sp2 hybridized. The carbonyl carbon is far downfield, near 200 ppm and the two different alkene carbons are near each other, around 130 ppm. You may also notice that the peak that represents three carbon atoms is taller than the others. This is sometimes the case, but unfortunately the height of a peak can't be used to estimate how many carbon atoms it represents. The carbon-13 spectrum can give us important information about the number of distinct carbon atoms within a molecule, and the environments those carbon atoms are in. It can help us to determine the structures of many molecules, but an even more useful technique, proton, or H1, NMR spectroscopy, gives us even more information. That topic will be introduced in the next video.